Hello and welcome to the episode of the Channel Perspective. I'm your host Justin Land, and today I have with me Vidika Kulhoff. She is a channel and a teacher as well as an artist, and I'm very excited to talk to her. Hello, Vidika. Hi, Justin. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. And how are you doing this fine evening? I'm fine, thank you. I'm doing good. Yeah, <laughs> I'm excited yeah. about this talk and. Uh, yeah, grateful for the opportunity to, to speak and share with people. I'm very grateful that you're able to make time because, uh, yeah, I've, I don't know about your work for a couple of years now, how you've uh, channeled Arjun and uh, from the Yayel civilization. I actually had another uh, channeler of um, a Yayel being of uh, the Gita Rose. She was ah, channeling wow. Bella. Yeah. And that was a very nice talk. And, um, yeah, today, yeah, I would like to focus a little bit more, of course, on you and the work you do um, in general. Like, how are you actually using this information you're gaining and channeling and, you know, developing something as I see on your website, uh, Design for Awareness, which actually has a wonderful uh, quote at the very beginning. I would actually say the quote. It is my passion to assist in building the bridge between our many multi-dimensional facets so that each can feel whole and complete again. As I know by heart, the integration of our connection to the stars for many on earth now contains an essential aspect of that wholeness. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank and, you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, please. So true, I tried to capture the core or the essence of what I feel I might be able to um, assist people with. Mm. And uh, so, it because you're actually literally using that relationship, that connection that you have to star beings or extraterrestrials uh, and bring it to us here on earth, a kind of understanding of the universe that is becoming, is new for us because whereas other civilizations, they've obviously, it seems like they know about this game. They know how it operates, the, the law of attraction, whatever name you may call it, but they understand the energetic principles behind the physics of, the real physics of existence um, based on beliefs and, and other aspects. And this, uh, for me, I feel like channelers in general and who get this information are the direct, uh, how do you say, universal libraries of knowledge just waiting from us for us to implement and that's mm -hmm. why i'm very uh, curious about your work and you know how, how does it how did you get into of course we can talk about that how do you get into channeling and your process uh, to where you are now um so thank you for that first of all um how did i get into, get into it i'll try a short version <laughs> because i've gone into this, um in several interviews and maybe some people already know the story but let me see if I can uh, put a light on it from a new angle. So first of all, this is the more general stuff. <laughs> I had, uh, in my personal experience, I've had contact experiences with extraterrestrials since I was a very young child. Uh, my first memories stem from when I, when I was about two and a half, three years old. I was in one of those little beds with, um, um, how do you call those? Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know the English word. Uh, What's the Dutch word? Bars, bars. I was looking for that word. Okay. The little beds with bars, so that uh, a crib, a crib. Don't, yeah, they they don't climb out of bed. These things. Mm. So I was putting myself up on the bars and watching the wall, and I remember that was the first time I consciously saw ETs come into my room through the wall. Mm. Um, nobody else needs to believe that that was a real thing. It's what I thought I observed uh, these visitations have been going on my entire childhood into my teenage years and adolescence um, first part of my life I was quite terrified of this this is just the simple truth <laughs> um, but that taught me a wonderful great deal about fear and transforming it uh, eventually with the assistance of a hypnotherapist at 23 I learned to fundamentally shift the illusion that something from outside was, you know, intruding in my reality. I, I learned to transform that into realizing, uh, remembering actually, that everything is a reflection of yourself so that I could communicate with it and it was a part of me and that changed everything, 180 degrees. And it's from about that age that I started to 
gently discover that I could communicate with these entities and, um, you know, engage in conversation. Uh, before that, I did get beautiful knowledge as well, even though some of the encounters were scary in my ego's perspective. <laughs> uh, there was a lot of beautiful information given to me, nevertheless, um, which is, I don't know, it's as if that taking that in and putting it into um, life, um, acting in the ways that were in alignment with that information and with my own higher self, brought me to do art school. Uh, I loved writing illustration or writing poems and drawing illustrations with them um, and painting. Um, so creative outlet was my way of translating the information that I got, even though I didn't fully understand yet, you know, how to perhaps speak about the source to other people because I was still very afraid and shy about that like sharing with the world, um, the beings that I was in contact with. Um, and I didn't really start speaking about it until in my later 20s. And that's when I discovered the phenomena of channeling, which I didn't know about before. I just didn't even know it existed. Even though I did draw pictures of, um, I did draw pictures of the ETs, of the hybrids that I saw. And um, uh, people said things like, Oh, they look a little bit like ETs, you know, but they look human too. And then I would say, you know, just from intuition, that's exactly what they are. They're a little bit of both. And I knew that that was correct, but I didn't even know the word hybrid yet at that time when I was making these drawings. So it's funny how eventually, as I learned more, everything came together. Um, and I guess the channeling is not something I aimed for in my life. It wasn't a mission or something I was trying to accomplish. I was really happy as an illustrator as well, as an artist. And if I had not become an artist, I would have probably done something in, I don't know, maybe vegan cooking or um, there's a lot of things I really enjoy doing. Gardening, I love animals. I could have worked in a zoo, I don't know, whatever, or freeing animals, much more likely. <laughs> so there's a lot passions that I have um, and I feel that following these passions brought me to the channeling work that I'm doing now so it's really beautiful the first time um, I was handed a book about channeling it was handed to me by somebody else uh, it was the Seth material Seth Speaks by Jane Roberts that's the first channeling material I got into my hands and I wasn't looking for it so a friend of mine said uh, this book is much too complicated for me, but I think you'll enjoy it. And I was like, that's such a weird thing to say. <laughs> you know, how do you mean? Uh, but then I started reading it and it really moved me very deeply. And I was impressed with the idea of meeting um, a woman in a sense. I mean, Jane Roberts doesn't live anymore, but I met her through the book, her energy and her work. Um, and discovering this person who wasn't afraid to speak about you know, the things that she had learned from source, just putting it generally now, um, with the entity Seth as a translator to fine tune it for her. And that was just so incredible for me that then I started looking further and I found other channelers. And that's when I eventually, actually very quickly uh, ended up in the ET corner mm. with the well-known um, hybrid channelers that have been going around for a while, that have been around for a while. Mm. and then I was really emotionally moved the first time I got into contact with that material and I felt, wow, I've just found, you know, uh, you know, the, the same energy frequency. It just moved me all the way through the same energy frequency that's been connecting with me all this time. And now I can look at it and be awake and observe it. That was incredible for me. And that's when our dialogue, me and uh, Yael, it really um, intensified. And I've had out-of-body experiences where I met um, members of the Sasani, the Shayel and the Yayel. All of these I have like really, I've had really vivid um, pictures of, uh, encounters with, uh, very tangible contact. And um, still, even though it was an out-of-body experience, to me it feels like I've been kind of living two lives. And when I decided to step out of uh, the closet, basically, that's kind of what it is, um, and share with friends and family the type of connection and share it with clients eventually even in the sessions that I now uh, 
yeah, facilitate um, by channeling for others. Uh, I feel that these two lives have started to blend and to merge. And I think everybody, every human being has um, a calling or a passion that maybe they're insecure about. Some people have already built their entire life around their passion and that's wonderful. And then the blending is right there. But a lot of people, I think the majority of humanity hasn't yet. And I think this is a really exciting time where more and more we're being invited to um, act on that type of blending um, for ourselves. So for me, this, this invitation to blend the, the inner world and the outer world um, was scary, still sometimes is. I'm still definitely challenging myself by being a public speaker in this way. Because um, I was very much more on the introvert side of the spectrum, especially, I mean, I did art school, I was an illustrator. You work behind the scenes as an illustrator. You never have to show your face, you don't have to say anything, you just make the pictures, you deliver them to wherever they need to go, other people enjoy them, you giggle because that's cool that they enjoy it. And then that's it, you know, you're not really involved, you know? And I was perfectly happy with that. But the thing is, I think within me, there was a yearning to overcome that ivory tower complex that is a little bit in me as a persona. Mm -hmm. And um, nothing has pushed me to the degree. <laughs> <laughs> has to step forward and share because I would have to and I really mean it I would have to be a hundred percent in love with something in order to do that mm. otherwise everything in me would be, you're crazy don't do this there's like cameras and you're acting all weird and when I just started channeling and saw the video recordings of this and with the ticks and everything mm. I felt oh, this is just insane what I'm doing why am I putting this out there it's the scariest thing uh, but now um, it feels like the blending is, you know, it's falling more and more into place. And I can only say I'm so grateful that I did and still am con continuing to to uh, face my fears in that way. Mm. So that's how I would say I use um, the messages from, from the entities that I speak with. Mm. Um, since they're very self-empowering and, and they... You could say teach us, but it's actually more they remind us of, of the information that we are ready to receive. And we asked for it to come to us. And whether some people get it through this pathway, like ET channeling, or through dreams, or through, I don't know, studying astrology, or speaking with a friend, or going into nature and living secluded. I think this same information is being sent to us in a thousand million ways right now. Right. And this is just one, but I'm, I'm really, really, um, yeah, excited and grateful for being able to be a part in this huge puzzle that is falling together right now. Mm, that's a beautiful, uh, very well said. And I, um, I can see how you looked at that. Like I can imagine, you know, if somebody had that direct experience of something could be quite scary, you know, an extraterrestrial walking in through a wall into your room and, you know, you're awake and you're aware and, you know, it doesn't matter what other people say, you have to trust your own perception and knowing that, oh, that was for me of some respect. And at the same time, um, then you see that there are no boundaries. It kind of dissolves, doesn't it? And, 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 then I think that's a lesson that allows a lot of people who've been through these contact experiences to actually uh, prepare, you know, be able to go over other fears because that's a, that's a fear that's actually maybe you know very primal too, you know, our our private space and protection and oh, if anything can you know very scary can walk you know come in through you know whatever that may be a snake or a lion or it doesn't matter if the lion loves you you know and the lion probably does you know as you know with animals they're it's they're, they're, it's with the vibration you give off and and of course the state if, if they're kind of hungry i guess but even then i think um and i think what i from what i understand with these extraterrestrial beings is they cannot present themselves to too many people uh because we just can't compute it and we will 
obviously, if we're not ready for that and cannot integrate it, it will damage our psyche quite a lot, correct? Uh, would you, I guess, in a segue to that, like, um, why not everybody's having this experience? <laughs> That's true. It's true. It's not everybody is having this experience because it's not relevant for everybody. I mean, that's the thing. Since we're all our own tonation within the orchestra of life, <laughs> um, uh, we will, you know, pull in as even I'm really looking at my words right now. So um, this is what Arjun also helps me uh, do. Just <laughs> be conscious about these things. Uh, that's what you learn. It does rub off on you after the years. <laughs> um, so every tonation within the orchestra of life, every person, every individual has their own uh, energy wavelength. And for some people, it may be a much smoother integration to receive a particular bit of information through a stranger on the street or from a book or from a movie, you know, inspiration will come in the shape that we allow it to manifest into. And it will be the perfect shape for that person in the perfect time for that person. I think if we now meet the ETs, as I understand it, we'll have, we'll have a sort of, most people will have a sort of um, short circuiting of the neurons in your brain. You kind of really, you don't damage yourself. I don't think damage is what happens there. Um, I think we take ourselves out. You just, you know, you just take yourself out. Uh, so you will faint eventually. You know, it's not like a horrible thing. <laughs> uh, it's just, you won't be able to compute like you said. And so you will take yourself out. Um, and it may feel for a moment as if you blew the fuses. Hmm. But, um, I don't think that would lead to damage as you used the word. Um, yeah, but that's probably not a good word to use. Uh, it's always for us anyway. So if yeah. it's meant to happen, you know, and somebody's exposed to that situation and they kind of, I don't know, do kind of things that per other people perceive as crazy, you know, talking about this and that, it's that feeling that of, sh you know, a self doubt, I think that also, did I, am I go am I going crazy because most of the world doesn't believe me oh, man. That, that's a very interesting aspect as well right I've thought that many times <laughs> particularly before uh, I had the sessions with uh, the man who uh, who was a hypnotherapist um, yeah, as a child, man, I, re I seriously doubt that my own sanity. <laughs> but I think it's a good thing, actually, because if you doubt your sanity, that in a paradoxical way actually shows that you are concerned about your sanity. So you do think about it. So you have a level of abstract thinking in you, which is able to actually disconnect from the situation at hand, which is good. It means you can put things in perspective. So I was able to actually zoom out, look at the, you know, this situation observe it critically and wonder like do other people have that also um it wasn't until i think when i was 21 or 22 when i asked some of my friends i finally dared asking do you guys have dreams that are so real that you when when something touches you or something you can feel it you can feel the fingerprints of your arms when you wake up do, do you hear the voices with the actual sound, the way you hear them when you normally speak when you're awake? I used to be so impressed with the dreams I had, which later turned out to be out of body experiences. And I didn't even know it because I didn't have any type of guidance. I didn't know the vocabulary that went with that type of experience. Mm. And now I get it. It's, I'm so happy. Yes. <laughs> but, but also when my friends, um, reflect back to me well no not that intense you know when they said that that they didn't experience it in that way most of them at least that's when I started thinking okay I could use some professional uh, reflections here and that's why I went to see um, the person who helped me put things in perspective for real mm. uh, and the uh, hypnotherapy corners a very beautiful background to have when you're um, confronted with people that are so that feel so affected by their dream states and dream world. Mm. I mean, for a normal therapist, it's beautiful. Of course, all therapists, uh, I believe, are in a way light workers and they're all guided by their own team of assistants, um, their own intuition. Um, but in general, 
mainstream therapy, I guess, or psychology, the dream realm has been, in my perspective, as I've been observing it so far, um, has been objectified so much. It's, it's made so much, oh, this is a symbol for such and such. And even though that's true, everything is a symbol, everything you observe is a symbol, um, it doesn't give contactees, just to use an old school world, <laughs> ET contactees, people who've had these type of experiences, it doesn't <coughs> give the um, consultants, I guess, the, the thing that these people need or the confirmation, the clarity, you know, why do these things happen? Um, how, what was going on, all of that. And not all of these questions matter because I still have a lot of questions myself about that. Maybe will never be answered and that's fine. Um, but it's interesting and I'm really grateful for that, that there is a, a whole wave of new facilitators, you know, stepping forth and stepping on the stage right now in the world that are hypnotherapists or they do quantum touch or they, they know how to, I don't know, dive deeper in that subconscious part and take their cue from there instead of, you know, the stories from the surface level. <laughs> And I'm really grateful that that's um, more available for people nowadays. Mm, I think that's a, a very good point because it doesn't matter what the title is of, of the healer or whatever. It could be a doctor, a shaman, mm -hmm. it could be a gym teacher. You know, it's, we have this, it, the connection to their source and their being. I think is it's that root, that vibration. So the hypnotherapist, um, I'm, I'm, you know, uh, I'm positive. He had that extra understanding of who he was, right? And mm -hmm. and it wasn't just a technique because there's obviously those that just use the technique of, you know, I guess hypnotherapists would you know try to get you into a hypnotic <laughs> state under suggestion. And and the and I've you know funny enough, a lot of these guys, you know, I think. You know, I think of people like Darren Brown uh, as a kind of, because I think he's, he's, this is interesting, you know, I'm, as I'm thinking about this, like, well, why am I talking about this? But it's always relevant. So, uh, yeah, Darren Brown, he has, what he uses is magic, right? And it's healing, right? On a big stage. And, okay. and I don't think he understands what, for example, quite the level that you do in the others, you know, but he's so good at it in the, in the technique, he believes that he's putting thoughts in people's head and, you know, and stuff like that. And he has such a certainty about his vibration that he can get you to do anything, right? He can get mm. you, you know, to walk like a cat or dog and, um, and under suggestion and, and showing the malleability of this environment of this reality too, to a lot of people. Uh, and yeah, it's, I think that. I just think that's a kind of a funny caveat to our reality that uh, it doesn't matter the mantle you're wearing. It matters the vibration you have that, that, that that's actually critical in any process of remembering healing or, um, and there are many people who are not very conscious that they are where the source of that power is, but they can still use it. If you, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like that, that's just a side note that I think that, uh, um, but it's even more powerful perhaps if you really know the real source of that. It's not the necessarily the technique or the mantle. It's 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 the love and yes and 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 um, that's what's for for me has always been healing and um, in every situation. I think that uh, from to go back to the uh, extraterrestrial aspect. Can you maybe explain a little bit about Arjun and the Yael civilization for those who are not familiar with it? What is, what are some of the, like, do they have daily routines or what is, what is our life like? Oh, that's such a funny question. Uh, wow. I never asked him this. <laughs> do you have daily routines? Probably. I don't know. Um, so I can't answer that one. I don't know. I, I would have to ask him. Um, I do know for people who are new with the IEL, um, that they're a hybrid race. So they contain a really high degree of our human DNA as we understand ourselves to be today. 
um, and uh, still a segment within them of the gray DNA, you know, the typical <laughs> uh, ETs as they're often depicted with the big eyes and big skull. Um, so there's a small segment of that still in them, and but the majority of it is is the human DNA, um, and they they are on a higher energy wavelength reality than we are, a uh, higher energy dimension. So they live in a very strong, close connection to their heart energy, much more than we usually do. Maybe we are there when we're in love. I don't know, but. Uh, we're definitely closer to that energy wavelength when we're in love, that's for sure. So, um, yeah, it's from that wavelength that they, as Arjuna has explained to me, answer our call. So we've been calling out for love. He mm. honestly has been telling me and people who asked, you know, what is your purpose for communicating with us, stuff like that. Very legit question, of course. Um, they say the human race has been like through a microphone, <laughs> you know, like shouting into the cosmos. Um, we wish to remember. Mm. We wish to be whole again. It's our strong, deep, heartfelt desire to, to understand our whole selves again. Um, and, and you can only ask for that if a segment of you understands that it is available. So this is the most important thing that we already know that we can get it. I mean, that's in us somehow. I think the entrepreneur, the, the, the pioneers, the people that, you know, travel far and wide, the, the explorer, the inventor, the artists, uh, a lot of these people we create, you know, it's from, from that self-confidence that we have in creating and building and being together that there is, I think, a very solid fundament of understanding that we are complete, you know, in the, in the fundament that we can be God goddesses in a sense. Humanity understands that, but it's on a very mental level. Mm. And it's often been misinterpreted. Uh, like you can do with the planet whatever you like, you know, <laughs> it's, it's put us a little bit in the we are the boss of everything kind of status. And that's very much this gray energy. It's this, the mind over the heart. Mm. And since we do know we can create and we are inventors and we understand our own God, goddess creatorship, we also understand through observation of the world and how much of that appears to be unfolding right now for us as a collective, we also understand something is missing. And that missing, I mean, it's in the works of Shakespeare, it's in books, it's, it's in, in plays, in movies, that huge longing, that, that melancholy, melancholy that's mm -hmm. within all of us. Melancholy, yeah. Yeah, that's what's radiating off this planet. And Arjuna's been putting it into images for me. So that's why I speak like this. Um, that's how, I, how I've been receiving this explanation from him. So... He shows that's like a color that beams off the planet, which is just, oh, please. <laughs> we want to, you know, bridge that gap, that awkward gap, because we sense it's there. We don't know how to put it into words completely, but we know it's there because we know we are missing something. And you know that because you know you can access it. And then you're opening up to the many ways wherein it may, quote unquote, find you when you go into a state of allowance. So the more we relax and the more we play and the more we allow ourselves to be our true natural selves, the more of that information naturally finds us. So mm. when we stop stressing out, <laughs> paradoxically, because we always think, you know, we've been raised to believe that if there's a problem at hand, there's huge pressure on the situation and we need to increase the pressure because it's a problem, you know, and that's not at all the way to find a solution. The way to find a solution is to actually detach from the illusion of the problem, realize you've created it, embrace it as it is for what it is right now. Let it go, all the expectation, all the tension, all the insistency. And then there you have it. The solution just comes to you. You will see suddenly the other end of the stick. Mm. And I think ET contact is that type of a surprise because 
the mass majority of humanity isn't quite expecting, I think, this particular type of communication. Uh, but a small group um, among us has been, uh, how would you say that? Maybe practicing a state Return. of allowance. Yeah, practicing a state of allowance that has led them to be the pioneers and the mm -hmm. entrepreneurs in this. And surprisingly, still, I'm still surprised about it on some level. I'm part of that group. But I meet others that are too almost every day. And that makes my heart just sing. And they're everywhere. I mean, I can say this now. I don't have to give any names. But there's people even in, in positions um, that are, you know, directors of big firms or work with big brands or even in oil companies <laughs> or politics or yes. with a bank. Um, I've seen all of these people um, and they're, they're there. They mm -hmm. have this open mind, they have this open heart. Uh, they rarely speak about it in public or to their colleagues or friends, but they're there. And it just uh, gives me a really, um, joyful feeling to know that there are so many more out there mm. than you might think you know <laughs> absolutely no I, I love that analogy i mean like the idea that we've shouted ourselves so much in darkness mm. that that's made such a call from our our heart our light so loud that the unit the galaxy the universe is hearing it and they're like like they they see us i guess now their perception, of course, is maybe not that we're, they have a different perception of what's happening, of course, and they, they it's not about necessarily, they want to help, but they know our path is this path. And, mm -hmm. and, and so they're coming like to a baby crying and knowing that the baby just needs to be soothed and everything will eventually work out. And I think like you were that baby in that crib, you know, and, came through the wall to you and wonderful way to kind of you know explain the human predicament i think that we're we're like in a cage but we're it's our own cage our own beliefs that everything is limited and you know especially this time of corona of course that's actually raised up our feeling of being in a cage of sorts but at the same time i'm noticing myself i know you're too the the telepathic connections we're we're doing is on a different level so that we understand the synchronicities, we understand the language of the universe and how it's speaking to us on a level that some people don't understand. And this is, um, this is what people are, need more confirmation of, that they're seeing, okay, like you said, the banker and, and, the, 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 and the guy at the, the bakery or whatever, mm -hmm. they, they have that and they, they just want to see it somewhere else and, and have an understanding of what's really going on the you know you can feel it in your heart but it's good of course to have the how would you say the and i'm thinking the german word funny enough the gerust you know gerust and in, in uh in uh, dutch would probably be similar uh it's the the framework when you're building a house you know you have a framework you need the you need that language to express it to kind of calm the mind because mm -hmm. the mind has difficulty believing the heart <laughs> it's like yeah. oh but the heart is much you know is connected to all and it's the wisdom it's your connection to arjun and to everything and um that's yeah that, yeah you're definitely a pioneer in this respect you've um you know i think it's, it's definitely showing us a way of life and living, uh, which you've actually incorporated into, you know, your your business is designed for awareness, which uh, seems like it's going in the direction of your um, artistic aspects, right? When you're talking about um, design for awareness, are you, are you incorporating your own, or is that is that correct? Yeah, in fact, it's it's kind of funny story. Um, I never changed the name. So when I was an illustrator, <laughs> oh wow, it was already called Design for Awareness because at some point I was asking myself, what is my highest excitement within doing this artistic um, expression, illustrating, uh, making um, some uh, house style for people, logos and branding and stuff as well. Uh, and at some point I just 
noticed I feel most at ease in translating into imagery um, what people uh, in say the yoga scene are looking for or who have a health store or so I started reaching out to that particular audience with my designs and I called my business at that time so way before I channeled I called it design for awareness oh. designing for people who were bringing awareness mm -hmm. and then this work um, kind of like fell on my plate <laughs> and I started experimenting with it and it went so bizarrely easy or how do I say um, quick like it was really rapidly shown to me uh, we are supporting you like the, the universe the yayal the this whole whoever is involved in a multi-dimensional way um, they let me know we're supporting you completely in this if you want to just you know do this you can really relax in it just trust and go you know and see what it, what what this can bring you so I started doing that and within I think three months it was my living uh, that's wow. real quick uh, really quick like <laughs> I mm -hmm. had a wait list in no time mm -hmm. for these sessions that in the beginning stages I started doing as test sessions because my rational mind wasn't convinced yet i was like okay well first seeing them believing <laughs> that was still there uh now i understand it's first believing then seeing but you know it's so right. uh, it's i had to convince the rational mind it's a little bit of this and that mm. uh, so i tried quote unquote i just gave it a try um the channeling sessions after arjun had let me know personally and also through another channel because i wouldn't listen um you know we can do this together for other people if you wish it was an open invitation but he had to repeat it several times before it really you know sank into me mm. and i was okay okay well why not let's give this a try then and i worked with some people who were open to the idea i didn't immediately tell them it was et related um i was still learning how to pronounce the words better in the beginning it sounded more robotic even channeling uh, i had to get used to the energy frequencies uh, the messages were loud and clear it was just my body wasn't up to speed i don't know how else to say it i had a lot more ticks in the beginning it was you know weird it's a weird journey learning how to channel but it was also really exciting and really awesome and i'm very happy that i did it and the feedback was so positive that eventually i decided i'm yeah i'm gonna continue this as long as it continues to feel this good to me and the feedback is this positive that's the two you know pillars i take or markers um if, if any of this changes i'll change direction as well because I want to stay in alignment with my own highest excitement and it needs to feel good on all perspectives. Mm. So as long as it feels this way, I'm doing this. Um, and so far it's been that way. <laughs> right. And so uh, the services you, you offer are one-to-ones where you channel Arjun and, and then you as Vidika are not necessarily present during the session or um, how does that work? I am a conscious janitor, so mm -hmm. I hear the words that are being spoken as I speak them, but it seems as if my conscious alert awareness, awareness, the mind is, has this like 10 minute span. I don't know how else to say it. It's like you don't walk somebody through a dream. You talk them through a dream. It's, that's how, I don't know how else to say it. Mm. Uh, and by the end of a session, I've forgotten the first question that was asked, but I know the tale. And I may know the red thread or the essence of that. I may mm -hmm. remember that. And if then a person um, speaks with me after a session and says, wow, this and this was really nice or interesting in the beginning, I will immediately remember it as if they're remembering me of a dream I just had. So then I can go back to the one hour ago or what was happening 30 minutes ago. But usually it's a very strong sense of presence you're just super in the now. So I pick the words in the now to match the energy frequency that they're sending me, to match the concept that they're sending me to answer this person by. Mm. Uh, but it puts you incredibly in the now. And there's this, for me, I think this is different for every channeler, um, slight 
sensation of seeming detachment with the body, but there isn't. You're, you're super connected still. You're not out of it. It just feels effortless. I think that's the best word. It's as if you don't have a body. That's, I, I forget my body when I channel. I forget I have a physical body, even though during channeling, I want to sit super up straight, straight up. <laughs> Um, and there's this thing, people who've seen me channel with my hands, that's like this, it's like high up. My elbows are never down. Like I'm never resting my hands on, in my lap or something, which seems a highly uncomfortable position. And it's not what I usually sit like, <laughs> but the funny thing is it's no effort at all to, to have that flow through me, this energy in, in harmony with the body and have that position while I do it. But the moment I snap out of it, I'm like, whoa, <laughs> I just, you know, I really feel that I've been sitting like that for an hour, for a moment. I'm like, whoa, oh, there's the body. Hello, you, you know, <laughs> it's always been there, of course. But so I think when people think or speak about being in a channeling or trans channeling state, you're not actually pushed out of your body. I don't believe that's actually what happens. It's more that you harmonize with the non-physical aspect of yourself or your higher self to such a degree that this physical dimension doesn't weigh on you so much or pull on you, mm. which it usually seems to do. Uh, but that gravity is just also something we actually imagine. Yes. Arjun has been saying gravity is also a, a collective co-creation. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I'm still busy wrapping my mind around that one. Uh, but yeah, so I'm a conscious channeler. And, and as I understand it, this is going to be more and more common for the new generations to come in channeling. Arjun also says this is just one step in the communication um, evolution. It's one of the first logical steps to have... Um, and higher dimensional species speak through the species that are being contacted. Mm. Uh, very, very important to always announce with that, that any listener of, or observer has the free choice to believe whatever is being said is true or not. I mean, mm. you can pick up your own mind, obviously. Uh, and this may very well be an aspect of my imagination and it's just very tangible to me, you know? <laughs> but the thing is, um, it's one of the first steps of contact, of open contact. And this is a very um, respectful way, non-invasive way of introducing yourself. If you have a good connection to the channeler as an entity, mm. you can get that very clear. First of all, you would have to set that very clear. Be very clear about it with the channeler that this is an offering. It's given without insistence. And then they would observe what the listeners do with the information that is being given by one of their own species. So that's phase number one and books and movies and everything that we feel inspired to share around the subject of ETs. Mm -hmm. Because as I understand it right now from Arjun, um, he's been explaining to me a little bit of the evolution of contact. This might be fun to throw in here. Yes. Uh, when um, the movie directors felt inspired in the 40s or the 50s or something to make movies that were super scary about Martians ate, eating our brains and stuff, mm -hmm. uh, that was our collective uh, subconscious purging the fear of the idea of an outside enemy coming to kill us all. Mm -hmm. And movies about that is a brilliant way of introducing a species with first of all the dark side of a particular idea because it simply still exists and it needs to be seen it needs to be put into the light or onto the screen in this case <laughs> right. so we can all face our fears um transform that within us oh it's just a movie or whatever you do to transform that and then that feel fear will be resolved and mm -hmm. then we go on to the next layer and the next layer may be people like uh, Jane Roberts channeling Steph and people reading those books, beginning to realize, wow, this is pretty profound information that we might actually use and it can be pragmatically used. I think mm -hmm. that's really important about um, channeled information. And then 
well, you may meet the channeler and feel the energy in the room and feel the shift, you know, mm -hmm. for yourself. And that may be another layer. And then maybe you have an out of body experience or you have um, with the plant medicine or naturally induced uh, some type of experience that you call spiritual that helps you remember how big you are. We're so big. <laughs> we have no idea. We often don't. And then, you know, from that, who knows, you may shift yourself to a version of Earth where one day, I don't know, some huge institute or some big media channel announces there is open contact and you can come and look them up in real life. Mm. Uh, I think these steps, you know, this is a very short version, but eventually it will all become more and more tangible. Mm. Right. Do in my reality i think that that's where we're heading but um mm, absolutely yeah, yeah. I, I i think uh we're definitely rising our vibration getting things uh approaching it with at least neutral uh feelings and a filter that's not so directly i mean i've seen some um hideous stuff on <laughs> on what they supposedly did to uh, aliens uh, i don't know if the, you know you see some of these videos that may be may or may not be real but it looked kind of real to me when they were inter interrogating that one alien at the mm. 51. It's a video that you can see. It's been maybe taken down, who knows, but whatever's happening there, I don't, it's, it's, you can see a higher consciousness literally not being understood by the interrogators. Yeah. <laughs> the consciousness talking about oneness, um, you know, we're here as, you know, we're all connected in one and, the, and literally the other, the soldier or whatever is saying, um what do you want from us what is your intent and like oh okay so yeah that that's how we would have in the fifth you know responded at that time you know and i think now we've kind of as you said through movies and whatnot come to an understanding that you know that it's it's, it's you know it, we can be a bit more playful with it as well so I, I think that's also important the playful aspect and and uh you know, if you see the scariest things already seen it, you know, and then you and then come into your reality. I've had that happen too. Like in situations like literally out of film sometimes pops up in your reality. And you're like, oh, but you're cool about it because I've actually seen this movie before. <laughs> and you're yeah. like, oh, okay. So that's the fluidity of, you know, imagination and consciousness, you know, everything melding into one and, everything exists, all these concepts are for the human mind, obviously going to be resisted. And I love that our brothers and sisters or family, interstellar family is approaching this with loving embrace. And uh, in no matter what our interpretation of the contact has been, it's usually been because of our own filters. That's mm -hmm. usually the, the, whatever's, you know, the light is blinding and it can be painful. I think that's a nice metaphor of us coming out of the Plato's cave, right? Yes. <laughs> we're all, I mean, I, I, we think we're, we think we're ready and I think we're, you know, we're getting ready, you know, but can you imagine a lot of the population is really going to be shocked. And the latest thing I've heard, Bashar supposedly said 2023 is a, a possibility now and is oh. one of his newest transmissions. And as you know, the Yael mm -hmm. is supposed to be the first race to, uh, this can change, of course, who knows? First race, just have to like race. jump in there. <laughs> yes, I have to be careful. Yeah, it's a lot of uh, very specifics and it's all just probabilities, you know, it's, it's whatever timeline, but that's, I, I feel like there's something, if that's true, then the Yael obviously perhaps is the most similar or comes from something about them that, um, can relate to us the most, perhaps. Is that is that is also a, a point to be made that the Yael yeah. may be more than I don't know with another race, the Orion race, perhaps uh, just maybe has a bit more of our hey, our genetics in them, right? Or I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure about that last mm. part, but um, about relating to us, I think. Well, if you if you would go by the looks, just the looks, then also, for instance, Pleiadians look quite a bit like us. Mm. So there is options, I think, when it comes to who will be the ones that through mass media, I mean, 
right. you know, make, make open contact. I think in the meantime, um, lots of people already have contact with also uh, Yael in dream states and so forth, or, or you see a lot of artists right now depicting them, which also helps us get used to their looks. Mm. Little, a little bit different. There's this little awkward energy about it, bigger eyes, everything. So we're getting used with a small segment of the population. We're getting used to their energy, but also to much more alien energy because a lot of extraterrestrial um, physical and non-physical energies are supporting us through this journey of transformation. And all these colors are represented in one way or another in our, in our species, I think also because we all have the cross connections, obviously, uh, not, you're never just from earth, you know? <laughs> so, um, because we're of this cosmos and we're remembering that now, mm. but yeah, very excited and curious to see how that first public contact will, you know, unfold like, and in what order and what way, um, Currently, I'm thinking more from the bottom up, if you know what I mean. It, I'm, I'm not so sure about, you know, watching the larger institutes and politics for the green lights on this one. Um, <laughs> uh, because that information, just as you just pointed out, also with the, um, the contact that they actually have had in the past with physical ET uh, beings, went right over their head, basically. And I, I have heard of instances where they had to call in a psychic, a psychic yes. to, help, to help them translate because that person could actually understand the being and the army people couldn't. Mm. Uh, so it's interesting how things are coming together. There are two now, um, as I understand, maybe not with the best of intents always, but in, in some very secret army segments, the idea of teleportation and stuff, it's also being practiced. And I don't believe that you can practice that without involving the heart energy. So it's really interesting that some of these soldiers are being trained to, how do they call it, remote viewing and stuff, to do these kind of things. But then if these soldiers are doing that, then they must be conscious of the fact that we are spirit we are limitless we are an infinite being and that must come with an awareness of love uh even though they might use it you know for other reasons i don't know <laughs> yeah. but there's beauty in that so i'm just cho choosing to focus on the beauty and um <clears throat> i love how for instance quantum physics is also uh, bringing us to a grander understanding of our actual nature I mean, it seems to me that most quantum physicists understand that we are in a multi-universe reality, mm. that all possibilities exist, that our mind influences matter. And you could say, oh, well, that's just, you know, airy, fairy, spiritual talk. But sit down with one of those quantum physicists and you get the exact same story, just in a different wording. And it's really interesting how we've been juggling as a human species. Um, these two worlds as if they're apart but there too i see a blending happening now much, much more rapidly than ever before and i'm so excited about it and i'm so curious where it's going to bring us and i really do think miracles can happen if this continues down that way definitely and uh anybody wants to watch watch the darren brown's miracles that's the episode i just watched uh, about a couple of days ago that fed into this conversation because i think it's a amazing a little bit like that soldier that you're talking about wow. i'm wondering how much of the heart and how much because it's a very high level what he's doing and and i'm sure that's very similar to teleportation i think that yeah. magic does exist and we can we've been seeing it you know and, and not just the magicians uh, but it's good to look at them as well you know and uh you know i don't know what the the aspect of intent is interesting because it all serves anyways so i think as you said the integration of all aspects the military the integration of all politics it does require that certain people rise up understanding universal consciousness to mm -hmm. allow for an integration process to happen so for yeah. to be there for those that don't understand who want to push the buttons say wait a second don't push that button so quick right. there could be something else going on that's the person you want to have there and how does that person get there they have to be kind of 
divided, you know, maybe in, or just lucky, you know, just um, never did anything, you know, to harm anybody and just kind of focused on, you know, the joy of teleportation and, oh, now you're in a, some sort of in, military institute, but it was your joy of a teleportation that brought you there. And so I, it's very interesting. Yeah, this, this is a, a oh, interesting. It's, it's really yeah. beautiful that you're saying this because just in the few minutes that we spoke before this interview, we mentioned Bob Lazar just a little bit amongst ourselves and this wonderful documentary that has been made about his um, well, story on Netflix. It's you, anyone can find it there. Uh, Flying Saucers and Area 51, I think it's called something like that. Um, and um, he, from his joy of um, investigating propel propulsion, how do you say this in proper English? Uh, 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 propulsion. Propulsion. It's okay. a hard word to say, I know. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that, that's, this is really like. <laughs> um, he was already investigating that and, and building his own devices and really, really good at it and super enthusiastic. And it's his passion and his joy that brought him to be invited into the army, which accidentally then uh, led him to be able to observe actual UFOs in a huge hangar that was that were kept there by um, secret uh, services or something. Um, and it's just beautiful how that storyline even though it's been super challenging on his part, I understand. Um, but it came out into the world because of him. And I'm so grateful for his, you know, courage in that. Mm. Um, and you don't really hear a lot of channelers talk about that side of the story, but I'm one of those geeky girls, I guess, <laughs> uh, or dads that is really, really interested in these kind of stories as well. I watch documentaries about um, those Tic Tac UFOs incidents. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's the videos that were um confirmed by um the pentagon this summer 2020 that they were legit um mm -hmm. that were these specific videos and there is a wonderful interview with one of the the jet uh, pilots that was actually taking these recordings uh on joe rogan <laughs> on youtube oh, yeah. uh so there's a lot of wonderful wonderful information out there even though these people are not at all talking about the spiritual side of the story they're often even making fun of it i can really watch that and enjoy it nonetheless because i'm just happy i'm just happy mm. that these kind of stories are reaching the majority of the population mm. and even though they're not fully seeing the full picture yet mm. i mean us, you know i don't either like nobody knows exactly how open contact is going to unfold it's going to be surprising no matter what for everyone i think um but these little seeds that are being planted that way it's just so exhilarating <laughs> it is. It is. so i love i love watching that side as well it's like um that's the food for my left brain and then the channeling is the food for my right brain and, i, I love know. my science fiction i love my uh fantasy uh, you know, and it's it's definitely fed into you know it's in my expression as well and yours I think and you know it's 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 obviously been intentionally put there in our in our vibration you know exactly. cause it's a passion of mine I, I literally I watch all these freaking adventure movies I was I was a, I was read comic books and mm -hmm. you know obviously the the Superman thing here you know <laughs> he comes from the stars Superman you know and it's it's a very beautiful story of a guy who had humble, you know, just a farmer's boy, you know, and then, you know, and, and, and of course people, if you've seen the Batman versus Superman, you know, where Batman can't believe that uh, Superman saw good. He's like, no, he's gotta have a, he's too powerful and he, you know, he's gotta be controlled, you know? And then you have, that's a very cool dynamic because you have the, the control, you know, justice. The yes, the mind. And the liver too. Yeah, that's a um, you know the, the liver is a very you know a right side type of thing where it just filters things, and the heart is more you know left side. And Superman is you know on the on the chest. You know it's 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 the and I just love that. The point is it's fantasy, but it's it's teaching kids. It's teaching you know taught us so much. Star Trek taught us so much. I mean that's a beautiful show of how we can harmonize with these races. It's, it's the blueprint. I believe it's the blueprint for a future Earth. You know, I mean, we're going to be teleporting. We're going to be getting into federations. It, it doesn't matter if it's 100 or 200, 
symphony, yeah. you know, but it seems inevitable that, you know, obviously the technology is a bit different probably because we don't need a spaceship necessarily to, uh, you know, do the, the IL they have, they do use like Arjun, is he like, I know Bashar uses a, a spaceship of sorts that represents his higher mind and he has it like, it's like a, a triangle or kind of shaped vehicle that D.R. Inkle actually saw at one point, if you know the story, he actually made a movie, First Contact, I think it's called. Uh -huh. I've seen and, it, yeah. Uh, you've seen it, yeah. And uh, I actually haven't seen it, but I know the story and so much about his work. And I'm just wondering, yeah, does, do the Yael use that craft? And, and does, where is Arjun in relation to you? Uh, depends. So every channeling session, he may be somewhere else. I don't always check in with him, like, where are you hanging out now? Because it's not necessarily relevant for the conversation. But sometimes people ask, uh, where are you now? And that's actually when he just suddenly shows me, like, oh, here or there. And he does use a similar ship, also triangular. Um, I've had a similar sighting just after, um, when I was 23, after I rounded off the sessions with the hypnotherapist um, person who helped me um, a few months after that, like maybe two months after that, I was with a friend and we had a close encounter with a triangular ship flying over. And this is actually what twisted everything for me or tilted it into the direction of beginning to consider that it might actually all have been ET all along. So I never dared going there with my mind because I was too afraid of it. Um, because of also how the idea of ETs was being represented in the, most of the movies at that time. Mm. Uh, and it was a lot more like violent. There was usually violence involved at least. Mm. Uh, so anyway, yeah, uh, the hybrid races, um, specifically the three youngest ones, the Sastani, of which uh, you know Bashar is one, the Shayal, that are kind of the mediators, you could say, between Sastani and Yayal. And um, Arjun also has a teacher in the Shayal species that I know about uh, and that I've met in an OBE. Um, and then you have the Yayal. So these three, uh, Arjun has been jokingly sharing with me uh, share ships <laughs> wow. so the idea of the triangular ships um they hitch along with each other they can all be on these ships it's it's a modern hybrid ship shape that represents any and all of these species whereas if you would see even though i have to be specific um it can alter shape it can warp it may look like a boomerang to one and a triangle to, to another person and just a light in the sky as well. Mm -hmm. It depends on how they um, fine tune the energy field, which is kind of like a magnetic ball that, oh my God, I, I lack scientific words for this kind of stuff. That's um, fine, I, I, I'm, yeah. you're saying it quite, quite well. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> which dissects the ship from our reality it kind of holds it in a neutral zone and you can see that glow but they can also choose to have that glow or have it be transparent even and then we wouldn't be able to see them so there's an agreement that happens really quick between an observer of a spaceship and those aboard the spaceship because they're always aware of those who can see them they, they understand we're being noticed at least mm. um, and usually there's a connection there, particularly with your first sighting. So whatever has been your first sighting, and now I understand these things I didn't at the time, um, often functions like a type of wake up call or um, solidi solidation for the fact that you have connections, that there is a future version of you or parallel simultaneous incarnation, whatever you wish to call it, it's the same thing. Um, in one of those species that is, well, giving you, you know, a little high to help you remember perhaps your grander, you know, spectrum. Mm. You above the human species, you have you have a stellar view at your disposal. We all do if we choose to tune in with that. Mm. And for some people, it's relevant to get that type of confirmation, and for some people, it isn't. Um, for me, it was an amazing experience. I'm so happy I was with a friend because I might have doubted myself afterwards otherwise. But so there was somebody with me and we both saw it and it was quite close. 
and it appeared in one um, foggy cloud. So you could usually, if, if, if a plane would fly that low with the lights on, you would see it all the way go through, the, through that cloud. It was too hazy, too, it wasn't solid. So mm. it would disappear in it. It just appeared in it. It didn't come from anywhere. It just was it daytime, daytime or nighttime? Night. Night, okay. Um, clear sky except for a few hazy clouds, uh, misty clouds. Mm -hmm. And it appeared in one and turned on the lights in one and then flew right over our heads. Uh, just took a few seconds, I guess, just enough time for us to breathe in. That's really what happened. And then disappeared in another... Um, hazy clouds, soundless, absolutely smooth, like on a glass plate, it moved perfectly smooth. Mm. And then this friend, we just both went <sighs> like that because we saw it and all you can do is gasp for air because that's you, you've never seen anything like this before. And I guess the energy of it maybe also affected us in the moment. Mm. And then we to each other and on our out breath, the immediate thing we said simultaneously was, did you see that in Dutch? <laughs> yes, uh, and we both were, yes, <laughs> what was that? And then the rest of the night we talked about it, obviously. But um, I didn't know about triangular ships having been seen by anybody else until I guess about eight or nine years after that. And mm. Daryl's I didn't know about Daryl. I didn't know about Bashar when that happened. Mm -hmm. So these ships are common. And a really fun thing for people to look up if they're listening to this and they're interested into this, like, oh, I love this stuff. Um, there have been many triangular ships uh, sightings in Europe. I mean, everybody knows about the Phoenix lights, or right. many people. But many people don't know that was a same similar type of mass sighting uh, over Brussels in Belgium mm. uh, in the early 90s. And you can look it up uh, if you uh, Wikipedia or Google search um, UFO sightings, Brussels. Uh, I thought it was 93. I'm not sure. It might be somewhere around that time. Um, and, and incredible documentaries have been made about that, too. Mm -hmm. These were the Yayal. Arjuna's confirmed to me as well. These right were now? also the Yayal. Did, huh? did she confirm to you just right now? No, he didn't just confirm right now, but he okay. confirmed. Uh, somebody asked uh, earlier, and okay. uh, these were also the Yayal. So Yayal, Sasani, Shayal, triangular. It's, it's a big chance that you're looking at one of those, even mm -hmm. though they may represent in different shapes as well. And, there are, and those are three races, and there's a triangular shape. Yep. Obviously, yeah, it, it's it's it is definitely uh, getting very interesting. I know Stephen Greer is doing some amazing work as well. Uh, I'm, I'm like I don't that dude when he goes he goes out on these field trips, and almost every time he's going, yeah, there's there's lights coming up and they're doing yeah. weird things, and he has a group of ten people with them who are like, "Wow, I've never seen this before," and so you have to. I guess he's so fearless too. Like, I mean, obviously yeah. you're prepared for this and. Uh, but he's like, oh yeah, I'm ready for that. Sh show me what you got. <laughs> and he, like every time you can pay for these trips, they're not so expensive. I think it's a very uh, cool experience and you, you bring you to a location and um, he does have issues with the, supposedly with the Air Force um, knowing about him and interfering. And as you're saying that, did you hear that motorcycle here? <laughs> yes, the interference, yes. Uh, that was yeah. that one. That was That's a that one. Very coincidental. <laughs> exactly. This is, uh, that's the way we live now, right? Just like crazy, you know, you know synchronicities that, uh, you know, it's just clarity. I think like you're like, okay, it's in the moment. Everything exists. And it's like, uh, how cra much crazy shit are you ready to handle? I mean, if you are ready for it, I think they could, they visit people. There, there's, of course, people who are dealing like, in physical contact and being on these ships. And I'm like, if you take me on a ship, I, I, that's gonna be a bit freaky for me. I'm not ready, you know, to, you know, hang out with, you know, people, beings that just, you know, but maybe I am, I don't know. That's the funny thing. My mind is like, and I know that they they know better than I do when I'm ready. So that's, that's reassuring as well. Well, you do know, it's mm. just that, uh, just there's so much um, misconception about this whole idea. Um, like me too, I've had many experiences of which 
plenty not so fun there was medical stuff going on as well i'm usually i'm not keen on uh, hospitals and these type of setups at all um so apparently they understand or on a higher level you understand what serves you in the persona you i mean um in this human perspective so you will you will blank the memories that don't serve you it's not that mm. they blank your memories uh it's they understand you will blank your memories <laughs> it's like so this part you will blank this part you probably won't there may be some kind of trigger or agreement and this is really fun that you mentioned dan brown earlier so they may use a collective like subconscious agreement that is there okay you have a choice do you wish to remember this if you don't this particular movement whatever i'm just making up something right now or this light flashing in your face or this rod moving by your body whatever will cause you to choose to blank your memories so this is the thing this is the oh. misconception often often it is it appears to the persona self or the ego, the fear-based ego, that our memories have been taken away from us or we didn't have a free voice in any of these encounters, but we did. Yes. I was afraid. I went through these moments as a child and after many times, but the fear I can see very clearly now was a result of me giving my power away and believing that something was done to me. There, that is never the case. It is always a co-creation. So once you understand that, then the nitty gritty details about, okay, how does that happen with the memories that suddenly disappear and the questions that don't get answered, all of that falls into place and <clears throat> begins to make more sense. So I think it's really important for the human race to, in general, understand that we're never a victim. We choose, we can choose to look at ourselves that way and you're free to do so. Uh, usually, if we do so, we do so because we think it serves us and that's, you know, justified in that line of thinking. And I would never judge that. But um, the more we see that we have a choice, I think this is the fundamental issue. The more we see that we have a choice in choosing to be a victim or choosing to be self-empowered about something, the more we can heal ourselves and support others in their own healing um but also it's not necessarily relevant to get answers to all of the questions we may have i went with um a friend a dear friend of mine from the us uh, who is an excellent hypnotherapist herself and she's she's very um how do you say um specialized in in et contact situations and i did a session with her over skype so i was in the netherlands she was there and she talked me through it and i had a, a snippet of a of a memory of a of these type of medical encounters and we went into it and not to freak people out or something but it was so realistic that at some point she had to count down to get me out of it mm. um to help me out of it because it was i felt physical pain and it was i was shaking wow and and i realized also from telepathic contact with an ET that was guiding me through that whole situation. It wasn't Arjun, by the way, it was more like um, in looks, more Sasani, but even more gray. So mm. more beginning stages of the project, the hybridization project. And um, that being explained to me without speaking, just sending it, um, the information, you know, you're free to dive deeper into this memory but you don't have to and it doesn't matter it doesn't matter for who you are and it's just a body it sounds really abstract when somebody says it's just a body i mean we're super connected to our bodies right um or attached to that idea that that is also you and it is mm. um, this and that spirit yes. and, and flesh so that was a really interesting excursion for me a little field trip to realize you know to get the answers to all of these particular interactions isn't you know it doesn't change anything um in the way that i could be of value right now to myself and for others mm. uh, i mean think about it <clears throat> if you um meet a new therapist and you're going to go for some sessions there. Do you need to know that that person, when they were 
10 years old, went to the dentist and had something removed and it was all bloody. <laughs> do you need to know that for them? Mm -hmm. They're competent in what they do. Does it matter for that person to tell you that? Mm -hmm. Do they need to remember all of these incidents that were frightening to them then to be of service to another now? Mm -hmm. So like, if the memories are clearly there and they bother you, yes, you need integration. Um, if you don't remember it, be happy you don't remember it. <laughs> right. No, I mean, it's, and again, like you mentioned, it probably was something life-saving or something that needed, that mm -hmm. was the fastest way to get one to vibrate higher is some sort of interaction. And exactly. based on previous agreements, I mean, there have been, we've all agreed to, I know I have, I mean, we're all, somehow there's been a, you know, and I'm, and I don't, like you said, I don't need to know, I'm accepting of that. You're absolutely right. I don't, it, it, it is definitely, you know, a permission slip too. So it's like, obviously, exactly. I can it's say that I've been healed of so much stuff in my dreams or on these encounters. And, and, and that allows my mind to be, oh, cool, then. I'm literally a new person every day. And I think that's a nice way of using these, I uh, mean, uh, permission slips or, you know, obviously the real experiences too, but everything is, as Bashar said, you know. Yeah, permission. you're right. And the beauty is I went into that experience because I wanted to explore something from a mental curiosity. So there mm -hmm. you go. Of yeah. course, the whole session onto itself is a co-creation with me with that hypnotherapist friend um and for me it was a wonderful lesson to realize it literally doesn't matter eventually i understood that whatever was going on in that medical procedure even though i was freaking out with my mind because i just don't like the idea of operations um whatever was being done or adjusted in my system at that moment through the idea of my body was assisting me was helping me to move further onto my path, to balance certain things out, to help me synchronize my energy frequency with a higher realm, which is beautiful, which is wonderful. And I could have just taken that information from my heart. I wouldn't, I didn't need to go to the whole, what did it exactly look like? Um, well, maybe you did though. I mean, it was always perfect. So no, you know. exactly. I did need to. And, and now I know I don't need to do it again. That's what I meant. So yeah. it's, it's it's, it's like it helped me see it helped me see and let go of, of a little part of me that was also still thinking oh so many things happened that i didn't keep track of you know mentally exactly detailed um maybe i still need to and and i let that go that idea mm, i you know um one of my inner encounters i guess you could say with these lights is you know i mean it's similar it's just, i just want to use this because it I think it explains so much is when I look directly at it, it wasn't there. But if I, when I shifted my perception to the left and the right, it was there. And I got the message. I was like, you don't, don't look too closely at what you, you know, in the middle, it's, it's things that are happening on the side there. All the work is being done there by our guides, you know, that they can be guides of angels, spirits, non-physical, you know, extraterrestrials that have a, you know, quasi physical state, they understand that they are energy and that they are literally the room, the spaceship, the, they understand that they're you. Mm -hmm. And, and we don't, you know, we're getting to understand that like on a, and you talked that before about like groups, I think musicians get that when they're in the flow of, of the band, it's one thing and you're like, and that's how I think we're supposed to go through life is, is, you know, you know, play the part we want and, shift around but realize that you know it's the joy of the co-creation and, and that we're all we're all helping each other in right. this process of ascension because you know we're not meant to do it and it's yeah it's it's not about a me it's about a we that's the, the main realization at the, that level and they're and getting comfortable with that just like okay no more like oh i did this by myself no we're never doing it by ourselves you know it's <laughs> like oh, it's like uh, I see that, and I'm I'm very appreciative, um, you know, that of uh, you know situations like this where you know synchronicity and co coincidence match me with somebody perfect at this moment to discuss topics that obviously have been in, within me and you as well, 
and we can put it out there for others who, who can take what they wish from it. And I know there's always somebody who has definitely been resonating with these things and, and that, that, that's for them. And, mm -hmm. and that's why I always, uh, that's one of my joys. And I'm very, very appreciative of your time, uh, Vidika and uh, Kolf. And people of course can reach you at your website, uh, designforawareness.com. And were any other links or sites that you would tell people to visit? YouTube, obviously you have a YouTube channel with all the Arjun. Which is under my own name uh, currently, but you will probably find it as well when you type design for awareness. Uh, the four in design for awareness is the number four, by the way. That's true. Um, and maybe fun to check out for people who believe themselves or understand themselves to be star seeds or you know what that means, um, at least colloquially speaking, I would say, these are people that understand to some degree or are curious about their own connection to the stars. Um, if you feel you're one of those, <laughs> if you wish to use that label as, as an idea, um, check out starseedhub.com. It's all written together. It's a website that I made with two friends from Oslo, Norway, and we made a, a type of Google Maps. You can make a free profile and you can put yourself on the map, literally, uh, with a little star. And then you can see if there's other star seats in your close uh, surroundings so that you can meet up in real life and have a cup of coffee or share your stories. Because my biggest challenge has been going through most of this by myself, or at least I thought I was by myself. <laughs> Thank you for that little reminder. In the beginning of my journey, and um, that idea has weighed a lot on me back then, or that version of me, better said. And now I can see it's, it's one of my greatest joys to, to bring the opportunity to other people to cross connect and to co-create with others from that understanding and from that curiosity in a playful manner. So if you wish to discover any other star seats in your near surroundings, go to starseedhub.com. That's always one that I want to mention in Definitely. addition. <laughs> All right, so I'll put the links below uh, and, and on Facebook, YouTube and uh, iTunes and uh, people can reach out to you. And I, of course, highly recommend your work. You've, you've been a service to me and the information you've brought. And I ask you to continue on with the, the wonderful work and service. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for your time and this wonderful invitation, Justin. I have really enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs>